So I'd like to thank uh, the Nestle Institute for inviting me and to have the honor to speak here. And um, welcome all of you to the second session of today. Um, so we are moving from the more or less easier part, just breastfeeding, formula feeding, to a much more complex issue, real feeding, complementary feeding, which is um, uh, in many ways much more complex. So uh, um, I will talk about um, complementary feeding mostly in developing countries, not on issues in, uh, uh, in, in uh, developed countries, not so in more deprived areas. So I will more focus on growth on weight and not on stunting or any other issue. So it's more on obesity and weight. So what are we talking about? So complement, complementary feeding is a relatively short period, usually between six months of age and two years of age or four months of age. And they are taking place a lot of nutritional changes, but it takes place in a period of high plasticity and growth. And on the other hand, it's a period with a high dependency on parental behaviors, beliefs, traditions, and also cooking cultures, cuisine. So what nutritional changes really take place and um, what macronutritional, nutritional, what quality changes take really place in this period and do they affect weight and obesity risk in the end. So that's, I will focus on this and not any, on any proxies. So like, oh, the quality of the food is better if I do this or that. I really focus on growth and weight, nothing else. So what are we talking about? Um, so the WHO is talking uh, on complementary feeding, differentiating in breast milk, and then solids, cow's milk, energy providing liquids, formula, and water. So that's all complementary feeding. But uh, usually in studies and pediatrics, we are differentiating between breast milk or formula feeding and solids, cow's milk, and energy providing liquids as complementary feeding. But sometimes this is again split up, and we are only talking about solids, or sometimes a combination of solids and complementary feeding. Uh, and energy provide uh, cow's milk, so and taking out energy providing liquids. So it depends on the studies, and um, so we basically most of the time I'm talking about solids combined with cow's milk. So what is complementary feeding? You can complementary feeding can be defined in timing, quantity, and quality, and what effects does this have? So on the one hand, we can have effects on energy intake. Of course, energy intake increases during complementary feeding, but are there differential increases? And of course, it can impact macro and micronutrient intake, and it could impact metabolism, microbiome, we um, touched this in the previous session, and it has an impact on flavor shaping. And all of this, in the end, leads to growth and, or differential growth and uh, increased obesity risk. I primarily will focus on an energy intake, micro and micronutrients, not on metabolism, microbiome, on flavor shaping, but because there is not too much literature out anyway. So it's anyway not uh, too much uh, 
on complementary feeding and really growth. What is complementary feeding influenced by? Concurrent feeding has an impact on complementary feeding. Either you are concurrently breastfeeding, formal feeding, or you have a mixed feeding, and this influences how much you and what you are eating during the time point. Also, previous feeding, like did you start with breastfeeding or formal feeding, or the earlier weight gain is influencing when you are starting or what you are eating, and these factors also influence obesity risk, showing that this is getting more and more complex. And of course, there are infant factors which influencing this whole spectrum of uh, factors, like appetite, or eating behavior, food acceptance, motor skills, and in the end, genetics. And on the other hand, there's the environment, the social economic status where the child is born into, the country of residence where they are living, the ethnicity, parental behaviors, like feeding style, or just secular trends. So comparing this uh, last 10 years to last 30 years, there might be considerable differences. And the environmental factors, of course, influence the infant behaviors and they interact. And to make it more difficult, we have the family food going alongside. So this is a um, blueprint what the child is eating during complementary feeding, what is offered, what it sees, what parents eat, and it's actually a much longer duration, the family food is how it's impacting weight gain and growth in the end. So it's very difficult to differentiate special effects during the complementary feeding period to effects which is translated through family foods which is given over the longer childhood lifespan. So making it difficult to see what are the real effects just happening during complementary feeding. So the, I did set the frame where I'm, what I'm talking about, and I will talk a little bit in between on the CHOP study mentioned beforehand. Um, the CHOP study is originally an intervention study on formula feeding, formula with different protein uh, containing um, formulas in the first year of life and it contains also an observational breastfeeding group. And in this study we have an intense um, collection of food diaries over the first two years of life and later on as well. So they have monthly three-day food protocols until three, uh, nine months of age at 12 months and age and yearly thereafter. Um, so we have a very dense data during complementary feeding. And I will show you some data on this. And this is a study conducted in five different countries in Europe. So with uh, all the um, different, different diets in uh, Europe. So to give you an impression how many data we have, I show you how many food diaries we have over the first two years of life of formula and breastfed children. You see that uh, over a thousand food protocols uh, with two-thirds from uh, formula fed children are included and giving a nice picture what is fed. So first of all, the easy part, timing of complementary feeding. That's easy, easy to measure and uh, very straightforward. So most data we have is on timing because it's easy, as I already said. So what do we know? So if you look at the time of introduction of complementary fee feeding uh, between formula and breastfed children, for instance, you see, first of all, 
that a considerable number of children are introduced to complementary foods before four months of age. This is from the CHOP study. And you also see that there's a difference between formula and breastfed children. And so breastfed children or formula-fed children being introduced to solids approximately two weeks later. And there's a steep increase that so until six months of age, almost everybody, two-thirds of all children or more than two-thirds of children are already introduced to solids in the European context. So differences between formula and breastfed children. And there are also, of course, difference between regions of the world. This is the same um, picture more or less with different dynamics. It's a study comparing introduction of complementary foods in Shanghai, Cincinnati, and Mexico City. And you see the differences between different regions. And you see also that many children are introduced even before four months of age to solids. So there is big variation. So what about the effects uh, of timing of uh, complementary foods on um, growth and obesity? There is a review from 2013 collecting 23 studies, and uh, they found in five of 21 studies that there is an association with higher BMI, so only five of 21, and one in seven found increased fat mass or fat percentage with early breastfeeding. So they conclude, no, there is no clear association of the timing of complementary feeding and overweight or obesity risk. However, they indicated that the start of complementary feeding before four months of age might increase the risk of obesity. There was an update of another uh, group in 2016 just focusing on the comparison about early introduction, so before four months of age. And they included 13 studies and uh, with 63,000 participants and uh, quite a few incident cases of obesity. And they conclude that the very early introduction, so before four months of age, increases the risk of overweight by 18% and the risk of obesity by 33%. So there is, is a risk if you introduce solids too early. Is there any difference if you are breastfed or formula fed? So does the timing matter, uh, the, the previous feeding type matter if you introduce solids early or not. There's one study uh, which compared the different timing in formula and, and breastfed children, and they showed that uh, the breastfed children, it didn't really matter if, so it's a, a a percentage of obese uh, of um, obese children is shown here, but in formula fed children, they saw a big effect. So there might be a differential effect of early solid introduction by feeding type. Why should that be? So is there any difference in energy intake? if you are introduced to solids or not. So this is uh, from the CHOP study in formula-fed children. And here you see the difference in energy between those fat solids in the given months and those not given solids. And you see here that those fat solids in general have higher energy intakes than those who are not. So it adds energy to the diet. Of course, it should, but uh, at an earlier time, they get more energy. So does this matter? It's another uh, uh, interesting finding. So if you compare pair the 
energy intake of those who are introduced early to solids and those who are later in categories and compare the energy intake over the whole spectrum from one month of age to eight years of age, you see that at every given time point, so that's a mixed model, the early introducers always have higher energy intake. So they are either, so they are always eating more. So you can speculate on the reasons here, but that's a very interesting finding. So does this matter if the energy intake is higher? So if you relate energy intake at three, six, 12, and 24 months on weight for length at 24 months, you see the earlier you are, the, the effect of the energy intake is higher in the early time points. So the earlier you get more energy, the more effect has the energy. So it is plausible that the early introduction of solids affects energy intakes and increases later weight and obesity risk. So what about quality of complementary feeding? Now it's getting more complicated and uh, less clear. There's also a review of, uh, from 2013, and there is not too much coming in in the last couple of years. There are uh, several studies, of course, but uh, in the end, relating it to growth, there's not, not too much more. And they included 10 studies which ident looked at complementary feeding quality and BMI later in life. And they concluded there is no data of any association of fat and carbohydrate intakes. So there is no study on that actually at that time point. There is no clear data on the types of complementary foods on effects on obesity. But they say there is some indication which was discussed by Brato Koletsko earlier again uh, already that protein intake especially diary intake, might have an impact. They say that at six months there's nothing, but at later time points there's something. So why should that be? And so there is, is for instance, uh, a nice study from the Alsberg group, and they looked at cow's milk intake at eight months of age. So Alsberg uh, started in the 90s, so there was a, still a different feeding um, behaviors in the family, so they started early and a lot of cow's milk was given. I think that changed by now. By, but they compared those with over 600 milliliters per cow's milk intake at eight months to others, and they concluded that those who are introduced to cow's milk are heavier at 10 years of age. And that's what they found. So if on the, this is a cow's milk group, they always have higher weight over the whole time course compared to formula, low intake, high intake, and uh, breastfed children. So they always have higher. So cow's milk seems to impact the later weight, and cow's milk, as you know, has a high protein in t um, content. So what other macronutrient changes take place? And that's uh, from the CHOP Chub study again. And if you look at the development of the protein, carbohydrate, and fat intake to the energy intake, uh, daily energy intake, you see there's a market shift on, from protein from approximately 9% to 16% at 24 months of age, and even and uh, there are high uh, changes in carbohydrates from 44% to 54% and a decrease in fat intake. That's a general picture which is seen in the, in the EU or the US. It's always uh, looking very similar, very much the same. So there is a markedly increase in protein, 
and they often are in most of the times increase even the recommendations of 50% energy and the fat intake decreases and fall partly below recommendations of 30 energy percent. What else changes? There is uh, the change of uh, protein covered from dairy, so the consume of uh, formula is decreasing. Of course, it's some, at some time uh, cow's milk is coming in, but in general the proportion of protein coming from uh, cow's milk or from, from dairy is decreasing, from meat is increasing, and from vegetables is also somehow increasing, but it's more or less stable very soon. And there's also from uh, some protein from, oh, no, the other way around, sorry, starchy and vegetables. So there is some, a lot of dynamic, and if you analyze that, uh, you have to know where you are on the time axis if you are looking at any analysis. So it's a very dynamic process. This is also showing the dynamics. Uh, that's the energy intake from um, in formula fed children, from formula, from comp commercial infant foods down here, and the dark blue line is the other solids, and on the top is energy providing liquids. You see the, at six months of age, uh, so there is a considerable proportion of commercial infant foods, and decreasing over time, and this is family food, so solids are becoming more important, and formula is decreasing. And if you're looking at the uh, breastfed children, you have to add the energy from breastfeeding. We measure, didn't man, me, uh, measure it, so the, uh, this part is missing. But the general picture looks very similar. So there's not much difference at, at the growth picture, at the, um, if you look at the um, scheme. But if you are looking, for instance, here at the six months, you see Comparing it here to the breastfed children, you see, okay, there are less energy from solids. So here you have 200, 200 uh, kilocalories, and here you are, uh, approximately have 260. So there are considerable differences between formula and breastfed children. And if you go further into details and looking at the contribution of complementary foods to daily intakes in formula fed children, so here you have solids at six months, about 30% of the energy at six months comes from solids and complementary foods. However, the proportion of carbohydrates is approximately 40% and the, of fat is only about 15%. So there is, uh, within the micronutrients, there, is a, there are shifts you have seen already before. And then if you, go into details what the solids are and the, uh, the commercial infant foods, looking only at commercial infant foods, you see, oh, they even have less fat and even have more carbohydrates over proportional to the contribution to energy. So there are differences within the foods given. Well, what else is going on? Energy providing liquids, sugar sweetened beverages. Is it a real concern or not? <coughs> well, energy providing liquids in the CHOP study, you can also see this is a for the best fat children, the percentage of children introduced to energy providing liquids, and in formula fat children, you see there is differences. So in sugared instant teas, formula fed children are a lot more exposed to sweetened drinks than those uh, best fed. So, and they are introduced very early, so from the beginning basically. So if you're going to the uh, WHO criteria, they are all not, um, uh, they are all already uh, introduced to complementary foods very early at one month of age. So it varies quite a bit by feeding type. They are introduced early, but the amounts are low 
but we have shown that they all add energy. So does it increase obesity risk in the end? That's what we are interested in. Well, there is a systematic review of systematic reviews. That's the latest trend we have. <coughs> because there are a lot of systematic reviews, everybody is doing some, and uh, we are summarizing here the systematic reviews, and they conclude there's inconsistent evidence that uh, sugared uh, beverages in early childhood have a long-term effect on overweight obesity. So yes, for later time points there is evidence, but not during the complementary feeding. We don't have any evidence. But there were very few studies relating this, so it's making it a little bit difficult. And there's one study I'd like to point you to uh, from Dr. Pan uh, in pediatrics. They examined 1,200 children more or less in the in feeding, in, uh, infant feeding practice study, and they found clear effects of sugar-sweetened beverages in uh, early life on obesity at six years of age. And I want to share you here. So they looked at the obesity at six years and they found uh, increased any sugar sweetened beverages of 1.2, uh, 1.7 in the uh, odds ratio for obesity. And there is also some indication that there are trends by by um, amount consumed, but not so clear. But it clearly shows that there is an increase in obesity risk. So the mode of feeding, does this affect any um, obesity risk? Looking at this, well, there are some data that prolonged bottle feeding has an effect, probably by the fact that uh, they are uh, consuming too much energy just because it's so easy, just uh, taking the bottle and uh, drinking it. And there's one example from the US Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. They uh, looked at 6,800 children and uh, looked at the obesity risk at five and a half years, and they found that they higher the use uh, of uh, the bottle use is the higher the obesity risk. There are some other studies, but the evidence is not that strong. So there is some indication at least. So what about feeding types? Um, I just want to focus two, on two feeding types, responsive feeding and baby-led feeding. Baby-led feeding especially because it's so trendy at the moment and um, responsive feeding because it's a recommendation of the WHO and there are nice trials uh, examining this effect on weight and growth and obesity risk. So what is responsive feeding? Probably all of you know, so parents feed infants directly and assist all the children when they feed themselves being sensitive to their hunger and satiety cues. Easy set but not so easy in reality. And if you go further, you have to feed with laugh and eye-to-eye -eye contact, which is not always the case. So that's part of the responsive feeding. So is this promoting a really uh, better growth or not? That's one of the questions uh, to be asked. And is baby-led feeding, uh, uh, does this have any effect? So. The idea is that the infant feeds itself from the beginning of the complementary feeding period, and um, it's the same food as family food. And it's just the chunks of the food are uh, in such a way that they can eat it. And it sh should uh, increase self-control and regulation, and by that in increase the um, likelihood of uh, less energy intake and better growth. So baby-led feeding, what can I tell you about this? Well, not, not too much, actually. Uh, studies are still ongoing. Um, there is some concern of undernutrition, 
And uh, there is one study comparing the weight in a baby led group and a spoon uh, fed group, but it's a group uh, very actually quite inappropriate comparison group because they are sampled by completely different routes and usually this is a, yes, it's a trial with high risk of bias but they showed that there is a in the baby late group there were a little bit more underweight children but also less over uh, obese children but uh, if this is really the truth needs real studies and uh, th these are ongoing so I cannot really tell you something. And the other problem I see with the baby led weaning is, of course, many children in the world are introduced to solids before six months of age. And to really uh, consume lumpy food, um, you need to be approximately six months, maybe some early, but uh, this is not fitting the reality in the world. But it's a nice, nice way, but uh, let's see what it uh, tells us in two or three years. What about responsive feeding? Um, well, um, it's, there is one uh, nice study uh, from, uh, in the, um, from Homan, the INSIGHT study, looking at the uh, responsive parenting intervention and if it's leading to healthier patterns uh, in the diet and also on, on the BMI. And they found basically in their study um, different feeding types or feeding patterns. So that's how, how people look at it. So they defined different feeding types. And so for instance, the breast fat fruit and vegetable group down here or the formula low diversity variety group and you see for instance here they are consuming quite a bit of french fries down here so at nine months of age that's certainly nothing we aim at but um, they do it and so the recommendations and what people do are quite a bit apart and they also looked uh, what effect uh, so they looked what uh, um, they te taught uh, the intervention group about uh, responsive feeding and they found that um, especially formula group, so that's a comparison, the formula fruits and vegetable group was uh, more likely to be the responsive parenting group. So they, especially the formula fed children seem to respond to this intervention to, to promote responsive feeding. And they also looked at the BMI and they found some effects, but uh, not, really, not really consistent. So in the end, they conclude uh, that the, but the, the responsive feeding showed no clear association with BMI, but the food patterns. So it's, again, only the proxies showing something, but not the really the intervention in itself. That's I. Right. So there's another study, the Nourish um, Randomized Control Trial in Australia. Uh, they started at four months of age with an intervention also on responsive feeding and um, increasing exposure to healthy foods and positive parenting, so warmth, encouragement, and self-efficacy. And they uh, started early on at four months and then followed those children up to five years of age, but they had a considerable dropout rate. But in the end, what they found, uh, borderline effect on overall BMI set score over the whole time period, and as, especially in the early times when they had more children in the study, they found a positive effect of, of the intervention. So the responsive feeding, introducing to healthier foods, uh, led to lower BMI set scores. So that was the aim, but it's only borderline, but uh, the trend is uh, pretty clear and obvious. So what is the summary here? Um, 
Well, I hope I'm not uh, disappointing you too much because um, there are not too many studies on complementary feeding and growth and obesity risk, to be honest. So there is uh, a lot of uh, timing and uh, we can conclude you shouldn't introduce complementary food feeding before four months of age as recommended. And you can also conclude there is no benefit if you in, in, in start complementary feeding between four and six months or after six months. So there's no effect on growth. So you can do it as recommended, at least in, um, in the sense for the growth. You shouldn't provide energy providing liquids during complementary feeding, pretty clear, but uh, it's uh, not done really. You should uh, avoid excessive cow's milk intake. Responsive feeding seems to be beneficial for growth. And I think families of children who are formula fed should be especially targeted because they have a lot of uh, um, behaviors that are not uh, related to positive eating behaviors and so on and have a high risk, uh, higher risk of uh, obesity. But in the end, the role of quality of complementary feeding is more or less unclear and needs much more uh, uh, studies. And there are some, uh, many open questions. I, I put some on the slides here. So, for instance, is the high dairy protein intake during complementary feeding a real concern or not? We had this question uh, during the previous session. Um, what is the time point where, uh, so in adults, protein to uh, lose weight. In infancy, we gain weight. That's what we say. But what is the time point where we are shifting to the uh, other way? So is it still in the second part, in the second year of life, a concern or not? So we need studies here. Or is the increase in carbohydrates, especially uh, from uh, commercial infant foods, uh, so added sugars, of concern, do they affect growth? Uh, do they affect later food acceptance and later obesity risk? Is glycemic index playing a role? So this is uh, also for uh, commercial infant foods uh, of uh, importance. So what metabolic effects does complementary feeding have really? There is almost nothing out. So there's hardly any study really looking at complementary feeding and metabolic effects and is there any programming taking place or not. And baby led weaning is an interesting approach and uh, we need to look at those results coming out in the next couple of years if it's really improving feeding styles and improving growth and obesity. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much in, uh, indeed, Veit, for a, a fascinating journey through that first year of life. Um, so we will open the floor to questions for Veit. I can see. Uh, while we're waiting for those hands to... Uh, do we see? Ah, yes. Apologies. Sir. Uh, I have a question about the vegan food. It's an increase in interest about vegan food, at least in Europe. Uh, if you put a child or infant on strict vegan food, would that uh, influence growth? Thank you. Well, uh, in the end, if, if you are uh, talking about evidence, um, well, there is not really a good evidence saying it is influencing uh, growth. Of course, uh, vegan food in itself, if you are so really strict vegan food, uh, might influence by um, uh, micronutrient deficiencies, but actually there is no studies showing it. Of course, there is there might be problems, but no studies. Yes, Susan, please. Thank you. 
Yes, so uh, the Allspark data on, on dairy intake and weight, I, I hadn't seen that data before and it's pretty impressively different, but I'm wondering if there's uh, what the height of those children was. Did, did anyone do the weight to height or the BMI percentile? Oh, I'm not sure yet. I'm not, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure. Because, because I, mean, yeah. I guess my concern is to make too much of an issue about dairy when we don't really know if the children but were actually over fat or overweight. Yes, uh, that's always a problem that uh, studies often pick out one anthropometric parameter. So here's just weight and I, I think the weight for length was also significant but not so nice. So they pick the weight. So, um, but the, on the other hand, um, on length, there is hardly any report, or it's only side tracks in the papers. You really have to search for it, the impact on length gain. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mahmoud. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your opinion regarding the early introduction of allergic uh, food components to the complementary feed? I mean, uh, if it's introduced uh, like egg, peanut, fish, uh, there, is, there was a systemic review recently in 2016 mentioning that early introduction can decrease the allergic response and the more tolerance to uh, these things. So, in general, there's a complete shift in the last five years or ten years. Uh, for previously, it was thought it might impact the allergic risk, but uh, this was more, uh, because the studies showing this, it was more um, that those children who are allergic, they didn't introduce the food. So. Um, there, so the evidence now is that early introduction is certainly better and uh, the variety of the foods introduced is much larger than originally uh, proposed. So in Germany the, the recommendations previously were always one food at a time, always three days at least, and then another one, and not, not the allergenic, potential allergenic foods, but now it's uh, not anymore like this. You introduce whatever you, what's recommended uh, at the age group. But uh, allergy risk is not increased by early introduction. Thank you. Thomas. Yes, I just wanted to comment on vegan diet. We had it up yesterday as well as a question. Uh, we have had heated discussions in Denmark about it, and we are, from the Minister of Health, very much against it when you're talking about below the uh, age two years. Um, they argue, the vegan society argue, that if you are breastfed up to two years, if you get B12 supplements, and if you get a varied diet, you are doing all right, and I think that is right, but I think it's risky business, and we have cases of B12 uh, uh, deficiency with brain, irreversible brain damage admitted. Um, a few of these cases had been uh, published. We had in the 70s the macrobiotic cohort in Holland showing a growth pattern which was very close to what you see in low-income countries because they get too much fiber, too li little energy, and too little fat. Of course, if you optimize your diet, it's all right, but we um, are afraid that it will, uh, it's, it's risky, and we say we don't want brain development to depend on one tablet. So therefore, we have been very much against it. Thank you for clarification. Yes. Please, thank you. Uh, so, is there, uh, there any relation between uh, time of starting complementary food and further food allergy or uh, incom uh, incomplete GI enzyme secretion? Uh, I mean, uh, starting of different food at inappropriate time. 
that's uh, picking up the same, as I understand it, the same questions uh, we had before. So that in, uh, in the former times, people thought and the first studies showed that there might be an increased risk. But this was in the last couple of years, new studies with a finer and a better design, they showed that there is no increased risk. Uh, question in the front, Dr. Lea. Thank you very much. Great talk again. Um, when we started the baby friendly, uh, baby friendly project in the hospital, we advised the parents, you know, the mothers, to start uh, weaning around six months, end of six months. Then we had this incident, this cases of food avulsion, where babies refuse to take the bottle or the food when, when mom, especially with working mothers, when they go back to work. So now we're advising. Uh, four to six months if the baby showed clues of, of wanting to eat in the fourth month. Um, would that something you practice as well? Uh, the other thing which I would... Uh, um, uh, mother asked me, if I am breastfeeding, should I breastfeed first and give the weaning food? Or, or what exactly she, she needs to do that? Um, what I do, I tell the mothers, up to one year, breastfeed, gap and then give the, you know, the winning food, the complementary food. That's, do, you have, do we have evidence for this? So in, in general, it depends where you are, when you should start. So the WHO and uh, many bodies recommend six months. In Europe, it's four to six months, depending on the readiness. So, and uh, it depends on the hygiene, on the infectious disease risk in the region. So I think, and, and how good complementary foods are and so on. So it's depending on your specific location. So I think it's right what you're doing, seems uh, to be right. And if you are looking at the acceptance of food, it is certainly a good option to breastfeed first and then introducing, uh, because if they know uh, uh, the taste already a little bit and you mix it a little bit, then the, the rate of acceptance is higher. So it's always a good option. Yes, question from the middle. Thank you. Uh, when should complementary feeds be started in babies who are born extremely preterm, according to the actual age or the corrected age? Well, good question. Um, actually, I'm not that sure uh, about the recommendations here. I have to pass this to somebody who knows that better than me. I have a, I have a question here. Apologies, uh, I'm not sure if I can. <laughs> I'm not good at handwriting. Um, I think uh, our question about the risk of um, of high fat. Uh, do you know this Is there one? a link between high fat intake in complementary feeding and the later risk of obesity in a child? And is there any association of high fat and metabolic programming? So, so far we know that are. Uh, all the studies I know of, and um, they could not relate the fat intake to any cardiometabolic risk in later life. So it seems to be less of a matter than, for instance, protein or too high carbohydrate intake. Yes, please, Mahmoud again. I mean, uh, according to one of the slides which you, 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 show, you showed that when the percentage of protein to energy is more than 15 to 20 percent, then the body mass index will be higher. And the risk of obesity, naturally, it will be higher on the long term, according to previous uh, sessions we saw. So don't you think if we start in general complementary feeding, uh, at, I mean, at six months, it's better than being at four months, avoiding the other uh, factors which 
I mean, necessitate early introduction? Because naturally, with, with, when you introduce complementary feed, I mean, the protein to energy uh, ratio, definitely it will, be, it will become in the range which was showed in your systemic study. Uh, so, so you mean if you're introducing solids a little bit later, the risk to introduce too much protein is less. And so you, we might have better... Uh, weight outcomes. Is this a question? Yes. yes. Well, so a actually the time window is not really uh, defined yet. So in the CHOP study and several other studies we are looking at the protein intake during the first year of life but starting after birth or the other studies in the first four months of life and they show the effect and then there are several observational studies and they are not all in the same direction and there's indication that the second year of life is still of importance but actually we don't know what's the time window of protein impact. There is a good indication that it is going on so I, we could be in line but the evidence is weak. I see. Could, I, could I add to that that is um, of course also an option to modify the choices of what exactly you feed. And while Fight has pointed out the question is still debated on what the role is of uh, protein in complementary feeding, um, there's clearly some indications that if there is an effect, it's stronger for animal than for vegetable protein. So, for example, if you would introduce more vegetable protein rich complementary food, there might be less of a risk of inducing an excessive effect. And for the question which was asked uh, regarding, it's the corrected age of the premature in which you start the premature, uh, which you start uh, complementary feeds. One question was asked from the uh, audience. Are you asking that, uh, Bertol? Um, I mean, <laughs> Well, I think it's uh, <laughs> I think it's something we all we all struggle with with the corrected age, and uh, and, and I see a huge variation where, where, wherever wherever we wherever we go. Um, practices uh, practices here are different from what I've seen in Europe, from what I've seen in, in Canada. So, uh, what what do we say? Well, we t we tend to say we tend to use the corrected age, but you do tend to find that these infants appear to take their solids much earlier. Um, and uh, whether that is because, unfortunately, many are bottle-fed and we're seeing those formula-fed infants uh, go on to solids quicker, um, uh, that may, may well be a part of it because we do struggle, or certainly we struggle to get, uh, uh, get ex exclusive breastfeeding in these infants. So I, think, uh, I don't think we ever achieve what we want. I think we do tend to feed a little earlier than desired, but uh, a, a huge variation in, in the practices that I've seen um, and I don't know whether I have a, there's a fixed rule that I would try to apply. I, I would agree. I don't think we have the evidence really for a clear recommendation. There's obviously conflicting um, elements here. One is that a baby born small, the preterm infant would need um, additional nutrients, be it iron, be it other micronutrients, earlier than a term baby. Uh, on the other hand, the readiness for spoon feeding may be later because of uh, more neurodevelopmental uh, challenges. And the third element is the parents who want their children to grow up and to be like the other children. They usually don't look at the corrected age, but at the uh, chronological age since the time of birth. So these are sort of conflicting elements where we can't really find an easy resolution. Um, and I think it's, it's time for exploring that in more detail. Yes, we have a question. Thank you. Is there an advantage or disadvantage of breastfeeding for two years? So you are talking about breastfeeding along the normal family feeding and, uh, well, um, it's as usual depending on the region and how you breastfeed and what you're doing, what you feed. So uh, in pediatric practice, you 
sometimes see people who are only breastfeeding and they are not properly introducing complementary foods and then you have a problem. And um, if you are talking about um, infections and risk of, of uh, also the protective effects, uh, I think depending if you are in a deprived area, in problematic areas with uh, shortage in food supplies, and once in a while it's probably more protective. Thank you. Uh, so I'll take the final question, if I, I may, Chairman's privilege. Um, it would appear to me that from the age of six months, the infants who are on a follow-on formula, as opposed to a term formula, would over those months be taking a great deal more protein than had they stayed on a lower protein formula. Has there been any study between infants who remain on the lower protein formula from six months as opposed to going to follow on? And does it have a, an effect on satiety? Do they take solids uh, less often? Or is, has that not really been looked at? Interesting question. And I don't know of any study. Um, at least, uh, uh, no, I cannot recollect any study comparing this. this is, anyway a unique situation that we have this follow-on, not all regions have the follow-on form of the higher protein content and the question is anyway why we have this. I think that's a general question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think we uh, need to stop there, so thank you very much indeed, Veit, for a great, uh, great first session. <laughs>